We can't answer the question, what am I to do, until we first answer the question, what am I to believe? As Christians, we're called to listen to God's Word, seeing it as the light that shapes our beliefs and guides our choices. Perhaps there's no more urgent place in today's world to embrace this reality than in God's good gifts of marriage, sex, and gender. In an effort to help us recover and live out God's will and way in these areas of life, Dr. Tim Tennant has written a fabulous book that will inform parents, youth workers, and pastors alike. I talk with Tim about his book, For the Body, Recovering a Theology of Gender, Sexuality, and the Human Body, on this episode of Youth Culture Matters. From the Center for Parent Youth Understanding, this is Youth Culture Matters. If you're a parent, youth worker, educator, counselor, grandparent, or anyone else who cares about kids, we're glad you've joined us for this practical, informative, and hope-filled podcast. This is a place where together we talk and think Christianly about the rapidly changing world of today's children, teens, and young adults. Well, welcome everybody to another episode of Youth Culture Matters. I'm Walt Mueller here at CPYU, and as always, we work very hard to have great conversations about things that matter in the world of youth culture and take a look at, at the issues that are out there under the light, the illuminating light of God's Word in a biblical world and life view. And perhaps there's, there's no issue, I think, that comes up more now when we talk about culture than matters of sexuality and gender and, and sexual identity. It just seems like that has snowballed over the last few years. And as a result, there's a lot of confusion, but the beauty in these conversations is we can go back to God's Word and, and look for God's good order and God's good design, that, that when we live into that, it leads to our flourishing and, and being fully human as God has called us to be. And, and this is an important conversation for us to have, again, because there's so much confusion out there and we know that youth workers and parents have a great responsibility to navigate this. We take seriously your responsibility, and we want to help you navigate that well. And that's why today uh, I, I have the great privilege of reconnecting with a seminary classmate, uh, Tim Tennant, Dr. Timothy Tennant, who is now the president of Asbury Theological Seminary as of this moment as we speak. It's wonderful, Tim, to see you after a few years, and uh, what a joy to be able to read your book for the body. Now, a lot of folks aren't familiar with you. I know you're a missiologist. That's how many in the church would know you, and then uh, also a seminary president. Uh, but this book here is is just a great, great theology. Before we jump into that, just, uh, just tell folks a little bit about your background and uh, a little bit about Asbury, because I want folks to know about that. Thank you, Walt. Uh, first of all, it's a, just a joy to be on, and thank you for the privilege. Um, we met at Gordon-Conwell. I spent years in the pastoral ministry uh, and then spent a lot of time in the mission field working in India, helping to pioneer a theological school in North India. I uh, eventually came back to Gordon-Conwell as a, a missions professor for 11 years, and then uh, back in 2009, uh, I transitioned to Asbury. I've been here now for my 14th year at Asbury Seminary. Uh, Asbury is the largest Wesleyan uh, seminary in, in the world. Uh, we're we're uh, basically are the the strong evangelical voice within the evangelical within the Wesleyan movement. So we train uh, over 90 different denominations, but most of our group are mostly from, you know, Methodist, Wesleyan, Free Methodist, Salvation Army, Christian Missionary Alliance. You know, a lot who are in the kind of the band of the Wesleyan movement. But uh, we we are just so thankful for the privilege of training people for ministry, and it's been a it's been a great ride. And God's blessed Asbury. We're having record enrollments, and we're just very thankful for His grace on us in these days. Oh, that's great. And and uh, you know, it's wonderful to track with you. And and I got to be honest, you know, when this book came out, I thought, wow, this is not like I expected the next book from Tim to be another missions text or something like that. And, you know, you're, you're, I, I always joked that my mom, you know, never imagined she'd have a son to grow up, uh, that would grow up and talk about matters of sexuality and gender. Maybe you're, it's the same thing with your parents, but you know, these are, these are timely issues. And I know you, you mentioned there when you're talking about Ab Asbury, the largest uh, evangelical Wesleyan seminary in the world. And as you went through, you know, some of those denominations and, and the Salvation Army and others, I know we've interacted with many folks there, and these issues that you address in this book for the body, Recovering a Theology of Gender, Sexuality, and the Human Body, are front and center there right now as well. Any of us who read the news 
That's true. are aware of this. Absolutely. And I, and I actually, as a missiologist, I actually feel like this book was more in keeping with my uh, field than I originally thought when I started it, because uh, missions is about crossing boundaries, crossing cultures. And I think one of the things that struck me about this book uh, and working in the Methodist world, especially, was that we had done a pretty good job convincing the world or telling the world that we were against something, but we really had not helped them to see what we were for. And I think even our young people, our youth, were saying, talking to their youth groups, et cetera, were saying, you know, they understand that Christians are against certain practices, but why are why is that? What 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 is the reason for it? Uh, the, what is the why of it? What is the what is the positive vision? I think that's really what the next generation really has to do is to bring us from uh, what we're against to what we're for. And that's why the book is called For the Body. Is trying to recapture the positive image and positive vision of the body. Yeah. Now it's interesting. As as right before I came on with you here, I went into my bookshelf. And I've got, uh, I guess it's like three shelves now that are overflowing with books about sexuality and gender. And one of the oldest ones that I grabbed, you know, just thinking about, the, the, I mean, these conversations really aren't new in terms of uh, some of the misunderstandings that are out there. And I grabbed a book off the shelf. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's uh, one of our seminary professors, Richard Loveless. I don't know if you saw the book he wrote in 1978 called Homosexuality and the Church, which he wrote uh, primarily to to have an evangelical voice, uh, uh, a solid Orthodox, uh, biblically grounded voice in this in these conversations as they were taking place in the denomination of my youth, which is now known as the Presbyterian Church USA, and so these these conversations were happening more, maybe at a level that uh, the the person in the pew or the kids sitting on the floor in the youth group wasn't really aware of. I know I wasn't aware of that, but this I was agree. the yeah, midst of the sexual revolution. And now we find ourselves, you know, everything's kind of trickled down. And now that's why this book that you have is so important. And I love how you say what we are for. We've heard that it's almost become a cliche now, right? That uh, the, the world needs to stop hearing about what the church is against, but what the, what the church is for. And I love that when it comes to matters of sexuality and gender, because so many of us have grown up, and I think some are still living in situations where, A, it wasn't talked about, sexual, matters of sexuality and gender weren't talked about. When they were talked about, they weren't talked about well. It was a brief, quick conversation that left you with the impression that these are dirty things that, as followers of Jesus, we don't talk about. And then C, uh, when it was talked about, it was always, here are the borders and boundaries. You can go this far. Don't cross these borders and boundaries. And, you know, so it was more like a, a list of rules. But the beauty of this is you, you're you telling us there's a whole theology. So give us, give us a bit of that positive tone and what you're trying to communicate here, especially with the theology of the body, for those who are unfamiliar with that term. Well, first of all, I want to say that I think that one of the challenges with the evangelical community is that we have gone through our lifetime, well, you, the lifetime that you and I both have lived, we go back and say, okay, well, in the 60s, we saw the, you know, the Woodstock generation, the sexual revolution. In the 70s, we saw the Roe versus Wade, the whole abortion thing was a fight. You go down the line, all the way down the line to, you know, the rise of adultery, broken homes, uh, the rise of a digital pornography, you know, assisted suicide. The, these were all church, issues that the church felt were things we had to fight in some way or resist in some way. And it felt like we were fighting, uh, you know, 15 different battles. And what finally dawned on me as we got into the gender reassignment especially was that actually all of these things are really about one thing, about the body. Uh, from the from the 60s to the present has been basically the rise of a, a Gnostic view of the body, which devalues the body. And so part of the Christian project is to recapture a proper view of the body. So the so this this book is really not specifically, though it has chapters that talk about it, it's not specifically about homosexual practice per se or whether or not someone should change their gender. It's really stepping back at the larger problem and saying this is really about how Christians understand the body. So the popular point is that we that our bodies were created by God and that our bodies are themselves pointers to uh, the incarnation of Christ and his resurrection, et cetera. And we can discuss all that more if you want. But yeah. I still think the body is uh, is not important. And even, even in the Wesleyan and in the Puritan tradition, where 
the means of grace, like the sacraments or baptism or hearing God's word preached or anything, all of this happens through the body. So the body is the way in which God communicates his grace to us. And so for us to have a collapse in the view of the body has grave consequences. And we're just seeing that little that landscape riddled across the culture that started back in the 60s, but mm -hmm. it goes on. to and It'll be more issues yet to come that are not yet before us, but it's all about the body. Yeah. Let, let me back up there. You you referred to uh, a Gnostic view of the body and, you know, Gnosticism. Just would you unpack that for folks to, to understand what Gnosticism is? Because I think what we need to realize is some, some people, oh, that's some ancient thing, you know, has nothing to do with life today. You know, and, and philosophically, most people couldn't describe what Gnosticism is, but yet functionally, we, we live it. We embrace it. And so, you know, pull back the curtain on that a little bit to explain what you meant by, you know, a Gnostic view of the body and some of that, you know, separation and dualism, all of that. Thank you. Well, yes, the, the Christian view of the body uh, or, or the Christian view of, of the world was rooted in the Jewish view, which was that creation is good and therefore the body is good or creation is good. So in the early century of the church, they struggled a lot. In fact, the number one challenge is called Gnosticism, which actually believed that the real you is the is the you inside of you and is disconnected from the body. And therefore, uh, God didn't actually create the world. He created it through a demiurge or some other mediator of some kind. So we actually, what you have is a devaluing of the world and the, and the created world in Gnosticism. So today when someone says, well, my physical biological markers might be male or female, but the real me is the is the me, me inside of me, this disconnected from my biology. That is actually a Gnostic view of the body. So in, certain, in some ways, we are uh, I'm sensing the emergence of, as the Christian worldview recedes in the Western world, it's we're seeing the reemergence of the original challenges we faced, which was Gnosticism, a devalued view of the body. Yeah, yeah. And I like how you, uh, yeah, for not, not, no pun intended, you put meat on the bones, right, uh, in terms of how we see that worked out today in terms of the, the transgender ideologies and that sort of thing. Um, yes. Where, can, can, I, can I ask you to maybe back up as well just a little bit thinking about how has this, from your vantage point, how has this view of the body snuck into the church? What weren't we talking about that we should have talked about? What was the what was the culture saying that has just become so compelling? You know, one of our things here is to just try to help people develop skills in discernment. You know, to be able to to you know kind of weed through everything that's out there in terms of the ideas and the values that are there in the culture. And I don't think we're getting that right. And so, what kinds of things would you caution us to look out for? You know, that are seeping into the church. I hope that makes sense. Because uh, I know you've watched the culture, and that's one of the things I really appreciate about the about the book. So, well, I I think well, what you've done in your ministry is an example of what needs to be done, which is the reconnecting of theology to daily issues that are happening. And say, take for example, pornography. You've written several books uh, and articles on pornography, or do or do things on pornography, and pornography really, I think, illustrates the problem in some ways because the rise of pornography is the disincarnation of a woman you know herself is disincarnated from her body right so you're so people are looking at a body apart from a person so it's the whole separation of body and spirit and the wholeness of who we are which is the christian problem so the problem is we have not made the connections to say actually uh, the incarnation of god in jesus christ shows the the value of human embodiment in fact, when God created the world, he was already preparing us for the fact that someday he would come as an incarnate one. So our bodies were designed to receive God himself. So therefore, the body is extremely important. And therefore, all of these things have happened, whether it be abortion, pornography, or you know, you know, changing your gender. All of these things are attacks on basic doctrines like creation, the incarnation, the uh, the devalue of childbearing today is an attack on the Trinity. But Walt, you know that when churches learn about doctrines like the Incarnation or the Trinity or creation, it's often disconnected from what this actually means in your life, in your church, in your views, in your 
your uh, values, all of those things. And so we have to do a lot better job of connecting what I call doctrines of the church to praxis and what it actually means for people. That seems to be the real challenge today. We've, we, uh, we haven't made those connections properly. That's a good point, and it makes me think, you know, one of the messages that we tr- are trying to communicate here, and I think many times it falls on deaf ears, you know this, that uh, doctrines are important to teach. Doctrines are important to teach in the home, that moms and dads teach doctrine. Of course, when we don't know doctrine, we can't teach it. Doctrines are important to teach in the world of youth ministry, and we've been really pushing youth workers, you know, in your teaching, teach doctrine because that's foundational, and you've mentioned that there. What are some of the, as you mentioned, doctrine, what are some of the historical Christian doctrines that can really help us navigate this? What, what would you, you know, push for folks to be teaching and then connecting to life in this world and applying? Well, let me just say something generally about it, then about this particular issue. I'd say that if you look at the history of the church, one of the most amazing things about it was it comes to catechesis or training people into the faith. What's so amazing is how much unanimity there is on that point. Uh, you would think, given all the difference in the church, we don't have as much unity as we do, but we actually, on this issue, we have uh, basically the church has always used the Ten Commandments, uh, the, the Apostles' Creed, and then a discussion uh, usually the sacraments, baptism and Lord's Supper, as a way of framing, you know, what what would the content we should teach the church, church new believers, and that goes all the way through, you know, Wesley's work, go back to Luther's catechisms, uh, John Calvin. There's been a common sense of that that this this is a core sense of teaching. I think the difference today is that we have to take the next step and say, for example, the doctrine of creation, which is the first line of the Apostles' Creed, you know, uh, God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth that the doctrine of creation uh, has implications for a lot of things that we've not made that connection. And so part of the, I think the challenge of of, uh, doctrine today is particularly doctrine of creation, the doctrine of the incarnation, uh, doctrine of the Trinity and the doctrine of the church, and even the, the notion of sacraments. If you look at the seven building blocks of a theology of the body in my book, uh, they, five of them are actually connected to specific Christian doctrines, like big-time doctrines, like the Trinity. So I think there is something about that that we need to make those connections and help people uh, make them alive while they're important to people. Yeah, this is so good. Hey, we need to take a break. We're chatting with Tim Tennant, uh, author of a great book for the body. I want to recommend this, Youth Workers, Parents. Get this and read this because this is the, this is the kind of book that— can serve as great source material for your teaching as you work to lead your students, your children and teens, through this uh, this cultural confusion that's out there on, on really, at the, at the core of who we are. So we'll be right back. Stick with us. Youth workers, here at CPYU, we're excited to announce a brand new youth worker training opportunity taking place in Ligonier, Pennsylvania, from March 6 to 9 of 2023. I want to invite you and your team to join us at the Northeast Youth Ministry Summit for four days of practical, hope-filled, and encouraging training and community building, all focused on this year's theme, Biblical Hope for Anxious Hearts. The Northeast Youth Ministry Summit is a joint effort of CPYU and Reformed Youth Ministries. You'll learn from Julie Lowe, Duffy Robbins, Doug Franklin, Danny Kwan, Ashley Belknap, myself, and a host of other youth ministry trainers through our large group sessions and 28 different breakouts. We hope you'll join us at the Northeast Youth Ministry Summit, Biblical Hope for Anxious Hearts, March 6 to 9 at the Ligonier Camp and Conference Center here in Pennsylvania. To learn more and to register, visit nymsummit.org. Well, welcome back, everybody. I, I want to let everybody know, I mean, if you're familiar with the podcast, you know that anything we mention on here as we interview and today with Tim Tennant about his book for the body, anything we mention in terms of books or articles or websites, we've mentioned Asbury Seminary. Chris Wagner here at CPYU will include links to all of these things, and you can just go to cpyu.org, look for the player 
for this particular episode. And if you scroll down underneath the player, you will find links to everything in the show notes. So uh, take advantage of that. That's one thing we try to do here is get you in touch with good resources. So, Tim, just a question here. Before we took the break, you were talking a bit about catechesis, and you and I you know, both have a, a real affinity for that. We have a, a mutual friend, uh, Dr. Gary Parrott, who's written a great book called, along with Steve Kang, called uh, Teaching the Faith, Forming the Faithful. And, boy, I recommend that to youth workers all the time. When I use the word catechesis or catechism, People look at you sort of with a blank stare anymore. If you have not grown up in a faith tradition, and, and I think in evangelicalism, this includes many, many people, maybe the great majority. We don't know what that is, yet it's something we're all involved in 24-7 in one way or another. Can you explain uh, you know, what that is edu- educationally in terms of Christian education and how we can implement that in our homes? And I know that's one of the recommendations you make at the end of the book, for us to, uh, you know, disciple a new generation, you talk about the value of this to lead them into a deeper understanding of, of who God has made them to be. Well, yes, uh, Walt, it's so important. And I think that one of the most amazing things about the modern church is that we know discipleship is important, but we don't really know what to do or how to do it. Right. And so Jesus in the Great Commission says, make disciples of all nations. It's actually the only imperative in that passage is to make disciples. Um, So it's a very important uh, part of the church's work. The word catechesis actually comes from the word for for sounding down or even echo. And the idea is that a older person would would give words of knowledge and insight to a young person who would repeat them like echo them and sound them back. So it's the way the church passes on the torch or the gospel message from generation to generation. Uh, So that needs to be done really in two levels. One is the level of the home, what happens in the home, and then two, what happens in the church. And so churches will have very elaborate uh, plans for how they uh, do it. But the challenge is the church often Uh, assumes people have grown up in the church from the very youngest period. And so today we're seeing a lot of people come into church that have never had a background in the church at all, have just now come into the Christ. So the book I wrote uh, entitled uh, Foundations of the Christian Faith is actually a guide to help a church know what do you do with a new believer? How do you introduce them to the faith? And it is uh, based on the Apostles' Creed, the Lord's Prayer, et cetera, uses the traditional structure mentioned earlier. But one of the differences between the old catechisms was the old ones were based on question, answer, just period. You give the question, we give the answer. But now I realize a lot of the parents we work with didn't know what the question was either. (laughs) They didn't know what it meant either. So now I have the the, the 30 main questions that we ask a, a young person, a child or whatever, but we also have an explanation that kind of lays it out, explains what, why that's important and what it is. So it's a pretty uh, basic introduction uh, to a, how to introduce the faith, what's important. And essentially, the church has focused on three areas. It's focused on doctrine, like what do we believe? That's really important. But also, it's based on ethics. What, what do What's our practices? What are practices that we do? And then thirdly, uh, the church has dealt a lot with certain rhythms like baptism, Lord's Supper, which are important for us uh, in our common unity as a church, what binds us together. So this, the catechism goes along those things and helps hit both doctrine, practice, uh, as well as um, the sacraments. Yeah, and and that's all in the context of, uh, you used the word discipleship, which I know is a word which is familiar to all of us, or should be if we're doing ministry, and we understand, uh, you know, the, the call of the Lord to for those of us who follow as disciples and to make disciples. I want to I want to jump on that for just a second because in the back of your book for the body you talk as I said earlier about discipling as you just mentioned a new generation and you have a section in there that I just underlined and starred. I actually <laughs> next to some I have a weird system Tim but I you know I'm a guy I mark up my books really good. You got like three stars, which is the maximum amount after next to a couple of paragraphs here. That's why I want to bring it up because this, like we see this, right? You call for 
that we need to have a vision for an ancient future form of discipleship. You're right. We need a better understanding of what it means to be a Christian in an increasingly non-Christian culture, not just what it means to become a Christian. And one of the trends that I've seen, and it's actually grown over the years, it hasn't diminished, it's increased, is that in our world of, um, of, of youth ministry, and I'll give you a case study here because uh, Duffy Robbins and I just last week did a symposium on traditional biblical sexuality and a changing youth culture, and one of our case studies, we have an interview with someone who said, I, I'm not, I really don't, in my church, you know, and in my, with my youth group, I, I don't want to address issues of sexuality or gender or the body. I just want, this is the way I hear it described, I just want to bring kids to Jesus. And, and there it seems it stops, right? We get the raised hand, the walk forward, uh, the, the profession of faith, whether that's actually a profession of faith that, that lasts or just something in the moment. But we get that, and, and then we say, okay, they're safe. And now it, it doesn't seem like faith gets integrated into any other areas of life. And certainly with the way that culture is instructing our kids today, the last place that if you're a kid in today's world and you're not going to integrate faith into life, it's into your, into your sense of yourself in terms of your sexuality and gender. And this is why I think we see so many of these kids sliding into this. So the way I would describe it is, you know, a, a detethering of sanctification from justification, which you really can't, you can't do that. I mean, if you're, if you're in, you know, true faith. So can you, that's, that's a long introduction to set you up for what you're saying here, because I got very excited about it because I think it nails uh, not just what's happening, but what needs to happen. Can you talk to parents and youth workers about that ancient future form of discipleship? Absolutely. We, we're definitely in a stage where we're at kind of the tail end of a massively user-friendly approach, which tries to minimize and domesticate Christianity. So it's the basic kind of controlling question. I call this like the, uh, uh, if you watch Star Trek, it's like the prom directive. Like, what is the evangelical prom directive? And it's this, what is the least one has to do to become a Christian? Mm. So that's been our problem. We we think that the que- the central question is, what's the least one has to do? When in fact, uh, the gospel message is always about pulling people into the full new creation, all it means to to be a part of the, the people of God, the kingdom of God. So you're right, to separate justification from sanctification, to talk about just becoming and not being a Christian, these are fatal flaws because it's unreproducible. It, only disciples reproduce. We all know that from history. So therefore, we have to focus on disciples. That's why the, Jesus' own community was 12. He started with 12, not with hundreds, because actually 12 will multiply because he made them actual disciples. So we have to return to that and understand the need for intentional discipleship. We have to be much more focused, be willing to accept smaller numbers. In the long run, it'll be much more fruitful. So that's the that's the ancient side of it. We have to appreciate the fact that, that our youth workers, they are aware of the culture. They're aware of the challenges. They, they, they know how to communicate well to young people. We should use those gifts. But they should never forget uh, the the ancient reality. What is the what is the gospel? What is the church? What does it mean to be belong to the church? These things don't change based on generational differences. So, I think we're getting away from a minimalistic Christianity, a domesticated Christianity, and I think students are wanting to be given the real thing. I mean, it, why would we downplay the true radical nature of the gospel to people's lives? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Just to jump on that a little bit further in the same section, and and again, this resonates with me because I think so quickly we say, you know, like, we've got kids on a youth retreat Saturday night. This is the way it works out, right? Saturday night we give a gospel presentation, and there's tears, and kids are saying, yeah, I want to follow. Maybe some of them for the first time, (laughs) maybe some of them for the 50th time. Um, And and I don't, you know, I, I don't, I think we make it easy, you know, that that's all there is. You actually call for, um, and, and you describe it as pre-baptism instruction, um, and I think that would apply in, in terms of sharing the gospel, that we really lay out, you know, here are the things you need to know before you make a commitment, before you, you know, say, yes, I want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So you talk about pre-baptism instruction and post-baptism instruction. Right. Could you, I know that a youth group is is not the church, the youth group is in the church, but could you 
just give youth workers and even parents a vision for embracing what what you're you know putting forth there in terms of that kind of instruction like how would that look well going back to the ancient modern approach the the reason that we have the church seasons of the year is actually all around catechesis and so the reason the lent period developed was because this was preparing people for easter sunday when they would be baptized so it was actually traditional like Augustine, for example, the most famous example, uh, Ambrose baptized him on Easter Sunday. So you actually have uh, the tradition at that time was you'd go through 40 days of instruction leading up to baptism. And, th- and that's when you're in the catechumen stage. That is the person that is being catechized or being discipled. But then after you are baptized, you still don't belong to the church. You belong to Christ. So there was another period uh, called mystagogy, where they would give you another period, which would lead up to the Pentecost, where you would then be uh, entered into the mystery of the church and receive Eucharist for the first time. So the church took very seriously, uh, what do you teach before you're baptized, which is, I think, our basic approach uh, to kind of what we normally do in, in like membership classes or whatever. But then what do you teach after baptism? like how to grow as a Christian, what does it mean to be a Christian, live as a Christian, a lot of issues. In fact, I deal with theology of the body in my catechesis in the mystagogy period. After baptism, you have to learn about the Christian view of the body, for example. So these things are all structured out. So the church took very seriously the fact that the Christians needed to go through a period of training both before and after baptism. Today, we lost after baptism pretty early on, then we began to lose the before baptism. And so now it's been reduced to a single decision yeah. on a Saturday night campfire. And it's just simply insufficient. It's not reproducible. It's not sustainable. And um, I just don't think it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and in so many ways, the proof of that is in so much of the data that we've been reading over the years coming out from a variety of sources saying kids, you know, graduate from high school and leave the church. And, right. you know, I mean, what, what, what else would we expect? So let's, let's circle back here to the theology of the body and explain a little bit of the history of that, where that comes from, and just a, a, a quick flyover, if you would, and, and how, you know, help us see how that can be incorporated into uh, not just our understanding of ourselves, but how we instruct our kids to understand who God has made them to be. Uh, I think the origin of this uh, as a real kind of modern day conversation in the church happens, uh, began with John Paul II when he was the Pope. And he, as the Popes do, they have a Wednesday homily. And so John Paul decided to dedicate his Wednesday homily to a, a building, a theology of the body from creation all the way to new creation. So he started this, and these are like 15 minute homilies, they're not very long. But he did this for years and years and years. This goes on for a big part of his papacy. Uh, He dedicates to building a theology of the body. This was eventually, after his uh, death, this was published as a a translated book into English, uh, which just kind of goes through, it just compiles all of his teaching on theology of the body. Uh, I read that book when it came out. I was deeply impacted by it because it was the first time I'd actually seen someone kind of build the whole thing theologically. Of course, he builds it as a Roman Catholic. But then there began to be kind of a whole enterprise of people who saw the value of it. And people like Christopher West, for example, who I think was probably the best person that began to bridge to the Protestant world. And this big venture hit the Anglicans and then others as it was spelled throughout the church to say we should develop this. And so I think that I often joke and say that the difference between uh, Roman Catholics and evangelicals on problems like in the culture is when the Roman Catholics have a problem, the uh, Pope calls in the Jesuits and says, you know, we have a big problem in the culture, go study it and come back in 15 years with a report. The evangelicals will write their ants from the back of an envelope on the way to a rally. (laughs) And that's, of course, overstating the point. But the idea was it was okay to take some years to stop and think and say, gosh, what is the problem here? And so I think it was John Paul, too, that really helped me to see that all the cultural problems that we face are 
really about the body. The problem I found with his book and the and the, all the Christopher West writings, et cetera, and others that have written on this is they never really said what a theology of the body was. They talked a lot about it, but they didn't really say, "Go, what what are the what does it mean to have a theology of the body?" So, my book I think is the first one that actually said there are seven building blocks. There are seven things that make up a theology of the body, and here they are: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think that's been helpful for a lot of people, including Roman Catholics who've written me, who say, I finally understand. I've heard a lot about this term, a reconstruction of a Christian view of the body, but now I understand what it is. And so that's kind of what I try to do in the book is lay out the key seven uh, building blocks of a proper theology of the body. All right. Can I ask you an unfair question? Can you just a quick fly over those seven, you know, State. I can. So, I, yeah, I, I can do it. I, I mean, you unpack them in the book, and that's why people need to get the book. And it's unfair to say, "Hey, tell us what the seven are." Right? Like, do it in do it in three minutes. That's impossible. But you in, can I'll at least highlight, minutes, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, the first building block and is that creation is good. We have to affirm the goodness of creation, and therefore, creation is trustworthy. That opens the 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 whole culture not only to Christian view, but also science. Science depends on trustworthy creation. The second building block is that our bodies are themselves spiritual mysteries or pointers. So I argue that the material body is a pointer or a, a window icon, a window into the incarnation of Jesus Christ, that our bodies are reflections of the incarnation. That's something we have to recover as Protestants because it's, it's much stronger in Roman Catholic theology, but it's really important that we recover the fact that our bodies are symbols of Christ's incarnation in the world. Part of that theology, number two, is still the idea that the body is the channel through which God extends his grace to us. Baptism happens in the body. Uh, the Eucharist happens in the body. Scripture is heard and, and spoken through the body, etc. Even serving the poor happens through the body. So the body is the way God's grace uh, is extended to us. And without the body, we don't have a, a capacity to receive the grace of God. The third building block is uh, recovery of the divine design of marriage. And of course, this is the one that Protestants are most familiar with, that marriage is a pointer to Christ and the church. And it's actually quite amazing that Paul, when he discusses the mystery of marriage, at the end of that, when he says, I'm discussing a great mystery, and you expect him to say, it's about a man and a woman, but he says it's about Christ and the church. That That's the actual, the great mystery to which marriage, even marriage points to, that's why there's no marriage in the new creation, because we give way to the, the the real point of it all, which is the church itself. The fourth is uh, childbearing. We've also lost uh, the nature of childbearing and the importance of it. It's become very pragmatic in our culture. And so children, of course, are the way in which we join God and become co-creators. We, we actually... The only way for us to understand what it's like to be God in the world is to become a creator. He allows us to join him in that creative process. And therefore, the Trinity is best described in the Scripture not as a doctrine about, you know, the relationship of the Godhead and all of that we talk about. But actually, the best way is father, mother, child. It's it's the the... The family is the greatest building block to understand the Trinity, the inner relational love, three but one. All of that is found in the family. So I argue that childbearing is crucial to understand the nature of God. Can I uh, can I just interject there? Yeah. Just a, a resource I just read. I don't know if you spotted this, Tim, or not, but in one of the recent uh, recent editions of uh, First Things, Kevin DeYoung had a piece uh, called The Case for Children. Which I yes. think really did you see that? I mean, it really takes. I didn't this, see it, but Kevin. Yeah. I know Kevin, of course, our student at Gordon Conwell too. Yeah, yeah, and and it, it's actually is is quite good to to read his <clears throat> reasoning. And by the way, he's living out what he preaches because he has nine children. So that's <laughs> God, what, bless. <laughs> God bless him. That's what I said as well. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, so the fifth building uh, block is another one which needs to be recovered, which is the power of celibacy. Uh, we really believe that the Protestants have to recapture that. The, there are actually two streams. There's the marriage stream, which lives in childbearing, and there's the celibate stream. And, the, and there's a lot of people, young people, who are called to celibacy. And we have to empower that again. Uh, you especially have this with the side B Christians that, are, that struggle with same-sex attraction, because the side B Christians are 
finding new power and joy in uh, a life of celibacy before God. This is becoming a, an entranceway into celibate life, which has been extremely important to recover that. And now we have the emergence of Protestant monas- monasteries, all of that. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interject there if it's okay as well, because that's where I want to say to youth workers and, and to parents as well, uh, th- this is something you need to teach, is we, we have to have a robust theology, not just of marriage, but of singleness as well, and friendship. And uh, honestly, Tim, you know, I, I go back my own years in youth group. I don't know that we ever broached that subject when I was a student, and I have to be honest as well. I don't know that I ever taught on that subject when I was a youth pastor in a local church. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I've actually uh, argued that, that one of the problems with our culture— <laughs> Because it's sexualized all relationships, we are seeing the diminishment of same-sex friendships, same-gender friendships. So the result is, after puberty, there's been a dramatic drop-off. My book highlights all of this, but a drop-off in uh, same-gender friendships. And so people assume if you're friendships, it must be sexualized. And so it keeps people away from the very vital role of friendship. So recovery of friendships is really, really important as well as part of this uh, uh you know, the whole celibacy point. The sixth body is uh, what it means for our bodies to act as sacraments in the world. And I argue that one of the problems with sacraments uh, is that we've taken the sacraments and separated them out. It's like something that we do that God does to forgive us for our sins or whatever in baptism or the Lord's Supper, rather than seeing that also it's about what happens to us in the world, that we become God's sacramental presence in the world. So bat, we're not just simply baptized uh, by faith. We're baptized into a faith. We're baptized into a collaborative corporate body, and therefore we have to know how to walk as Christians in the world. So a person who walks out of a Lord's Supper, for example, should go out into the world as a transformed person. And so I actually argue that our bodies are meant to be the sacramental presence of God in the world. And then the last uh, uh, body, the last building block is what's called the quotidian mystery or the, uh, the the ordinary stuff of life, that we actually believe that God intended for even the most mundane task to be filled with almost a sacramental liturgical presence. So think about things like folding clothes or mowing the grass or, you know, uh, all the stuff we'd taken the trash out, all these things that we do, the society has turned those into mundane things. But actually, part of my argument in the book is the recovery of the dignity of all work, uh, moving away from the idea that the only se- only sacred work is is ordained work. You know, this is actually the work of all of us. So changing diapers is actually a sacramental act as we work uh, before God in the world. And I argue, that, and I joke at the end of the book, I say, you know, we started the book with, you know, God creating the universe. We end up with somebody changing diapers. But I, I really believe that theology of the body should encompass all of that. And so that's that's a brief overview of the seven building blocks. That's, that's really, really good. And I, again, I'm going to recommend, you know, as, as uh, Tim gives us a little flyover here, again, unfair to ask him to do that, but he does highlight everything, you know, that's in there, the, the major points, get this and read this, because again, these are things that we need to teach. And just even at the level of what you just mentioned there about, you know, all work is, is sacred, That that is, you know, just a the way that that could radically transform a young person whose giftedness and whose bent and and whose calling, if we teach on calling, is, you know, into something that's devalued in our culture or seen, as you say, as mundane, right? That we do all things to the glory of God. So this is, you know... And the other side of that problem is that we, we, our culture only values compensated work. So if you don't get, things you don't get paid for devalued. So Obviously, being a friend, being a husband, being a wife, being a, all these things are so important are not valued because not compensated. Yeah. So the, that's another huge part of this problem we're trying to address. Yeah. Working at CPYU, Chris, you got to remember that there. That's a good <laughs> good word. Hey, we're going to take our, uh, another break, come back for our last little segment with Tim. And I've got a, uh, I got a big question to ask when we come back. Stick with us. If you enjoy listening to Youth Culture Matters and would like to support the ongoing efforts of this ministry, you can do so by visiting cpyu.org slash giving to make a donation. Your prayers and financial support make this podcast possible.
Well, I said before the break, I've got this question, and it really is about the way we, we verbalize things. Those We hear this a lot, you know, with folks who are struggling with same-sex attraction or dealing with some kind of gender dysphoria or, or uh, you know, thinking in terms that, you know, maybe they were, they were, their body is wrong. It doesn't match up with what's in their mind, you know. Where did this come from? And, and you've got a section in here, Tim, where you talk about, I was born this way versus God made me this way. And I think those are, we hear that a lot, but I also think we need to differentiate and, and understand what is being said here and how to unpack those statements and respond to them. Can you speak to those, if you would? Yeah, it's a great question, Walt. And I do think that the we, we have the assumption today that to say I was born that way means God made me that way. And I challenge that in the book because, again, this goes back to a big doctrine, uh, the doctrine of the fall. What does it mean to be part of the fallen race? So uh, going back in church history to Venerable Bede, eventually to Augustine and Thomas Aquinas, all to the Christian tradition, they believe that they're what they call the four wounds of the fall. In other words, the church is trying to understand, is it just true that we're sinful and that we're just there's just thousands of sins? Uh, that may be true. But the other idea was to say maybe the, the thousands and even every year we invent new new sins, but do in fact the sins all go back to four or some smaller group of basic wounds that go with the human race. And so part of uh, that theology argues that, in fact, all the sins that we produce generally go back to certain problems, you know, like greed or malice and so forth. So one of the um, one of the wounds of the fall was what they call in the ancient world compiscuance or sexual malformation, which is to say that part of the basic wound of the fall was a that sexual desires have gotten malformed. And therefore, out of that, of course, comes hundreds of potential sexual sins. And I actually appreciate people who've criticized, you know, why do we focus on this one sexual sin? There's so many. Yep. If I could get, away, get rid of pornography, we should or whatever. All that is so true. We have so many things that have come out of sexual malformation. So uh, when we're born, we are born with uh, malformation and these four wounds of the fall. So when someone says, you know, I can never remember not feeling this way. Um, I'm reminded of C.S. Lewis, who said, you know, even though I never have had a, a inclination toward gambling, I, I, I lack the quality that takes it to, to be a gambler, because the sides of sin are always a virtue, the side of every sin, right? So I think in some ways, we haven't acknowledged enough the fact that part of the fa fall includes for many people malformed sexual desires, and that has produced a lot of brokenness. That's different from saying God designed you that way. God made you that way. So we should be part of the recovery is recovering a doctrine of the fall, where we acknowledge the fact that people are born with and not just the sexual problems, but also people are born with malice, for example, and they have issues with anger or issues that need to be dealt with by the church. But they can say, I always felt this anger in my life. We don't, would never say, therefore, God made you that way. We understand that God designed us to be whole, to be holy. But the fall has created uh, brokenness in the human race. Mm. And I, I love that as well. I, you know, again, this is where a good theology, you know, when Duffy and I were together last week, we, we said to folks, you know, hey, look, a great way to, to teach about sexuality and gender is go through God's story, creation, fall, redemption, restoration, right? And we go back to creation and we understand God's good intent, what shalom is, right? That universal flourishing and then the fall how everything becomes uh, dis disordered as a result of sin. And I love the way you make that distinction there. Uh, one of the things I just want to say, and I, maybe you can comment on this. I don't know if you found this to be the case in your reading, but as I've read through, uh, you know, attempts at uh, justification of more progressive views in the church on LGBTQ issues, uh, there's there's this sense that— um, you know we're gonna we're gonna appeal to scripture, but I don't see people going back to Genesis. We don't go back to you know what God's good order, design, and intent are. And I, I I just appreciate the fact that you do that, and would encourage folks who are listening to do that as well. Well, I was inspired by Jesus because when he was yeah. challenged by the Pharisees about divorce, he said, "Well, from the beginning it was not so," and he yeah. goes back to Genesis. Yeah. So 
I think that's actually a good um, analogy right there that what yeah. Jesus himself yeah. showed us the way. I, I appreciate the fact that you're letting Jesus challenge you. That's awesome. I got. <laughs> we have to do that more, right? I think, and I, I know. I mean, we laugh about this, but again, we we're not listening to what Jesus said. And I think, you know, so so many times, like I think of that, you know, well, Jesus just said, "Love people, don't judge people, love people," and we don't understand what exactly he was saying when he said those things, along with the the context that that was in of, of the rest of of whatever it was he said, you know, so. Uh, go back and study that. Well, let me, we, we got to bring this to an end, Tim. And I, I want to ask you, as I always do, to finish up with a uh, very practical word, very practical challenges. You're a dad, right? You've been in ministry. Um, you know, do you, do you have a word first for parents on this? Just a word of challenge, a practical word, and then uh, a word for youth workers as well, because these are issues you care deeply about. And I know that uh, all of us should should care deeply about these things and really work uh, to 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 live within God's will and God's way on this and minister well, parent well. Well, I would say both the parents and the youth workers, I would want to encourage them and strengthen them and remind them how sacred their work is. Uh, I look back on my own life and I feel like I never really fully realized the sacredness of my work as a parent, you know, raising our children and forming them. And I, I could, naturally, I'd go back and, you know, redo 25 things differently. But I, I do want to say it's it's a sacred work and the privilege of shaping and forming lives is so important. And I think also um, for youth workers, um, I do think everyone acknowledges, and I obviously, while well, your whole ministry has is, is shown this, but there is a particular window in youth that is like, you don't get it back. You just don't get it back. It's an opportunity to speak in someone's life and to to help them to think differently. That's why I think in so many ways, if I could change one thing, I would say I was too impressed with thinking that if I talk to a hundred people, it's more better. It's better talking to ten people. That actually, I wish I'd spent more time with less people and poured my life more into fewer rather than saying less to more people. And I think in some ways, that's what youth workers do. That's what parents do. The The family is the most basic little unit of the church. That is the, the basic unit. And to have that opportunity to raise two children or to speak to some small group that you may not think anybody knows you're out there, but that youth pastor out there on the front lines is a critical person in the future of the church. And I just want to honor them and tell them that uh, your your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Don't be weary. Uh, just hang in there because God will multiply your work if you're faithful to Him. That is a, that is a great word and so timely. You know, as I think about uh, youth workers just feeling the push and the pull of living in an age of celebrity and being challenged to you know pursue celebrity themselves and you know get the numbers and the metrics and that that was that was a good word i'm going to go back i'm going to listen to that about three or four times i'm, I'm that's a quote you're going to you'll see that on twitter tim that was good i love that so that just a great word for youth workers well what a joy it is for me to be able to connect with tim tennant and talk about his book for the body yeah the subtitle is recovering a theology of gender sexuality in the human body it's published by zondervan got some great endorsements on it uh, who's this guy, David Wells? What in the world? The, was he the, <laughs> the pitcher for? Yeah, no, that's I. I'll tell you what. If you get an endorsement from David Wells, that that is like that's the best. So, uh, Tim, that's thanks it. so much. Thank you so much. Thanks, thanks for writing the book. God thanks for joining. Me. All right, blessings to you. Thanks so much. Bye bye. We'll say goodbye to the rest of you and uh, stick with us. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with our next uh, next episode of Youth Culture Matters. Thanks for joining us for Youth Culture Matters, a podcast from the Center for Parent Youth Understanding. If you'd like to learn more about today's youth culture, visit our website at cpyu.org. And if you have any questions, comments, or feedback, email us at podcast at cpyu.org.